love. Find someone in that niche like Jay or myself that have been through a bunch of cycles and then put the blinders on for three to seven years and you'll have a great experience. Don't get caught up in the shiny object syndrome. If you're a real estate investor and are wondering how to raise and leverage private money to make more profit on every deal, then you're in the right place. On Raising Private Money, we'll speak with new and seasoned investors to dissect their deals and extract the best tips and strategies to help you get the money, because the money comes first. Now here's your host, Jay Conner. Welcome to another amazing episode of Raising Private Money. On this podcast, this is where we talk about how to attract and raise private money for your real estate deals without ever asking for money. Well, today I have got a very good friend and an amazing guest that you're going to really enjoy. First of all, my guest has been in real estate now for almost 30 years. His experience ranges from constructing new homes and owning a realty executive franchise to running his own investments, commercial and residential. Well, my guest runs his own buying and selling house business, with his family team, which purchases two to five properties monthly. So they're in the trenches every single week, knowing what's going on in the market today. In addition to that, he's a three-time best-selling author of Real Estate on Your Terms, The New Rules of Real Estate Investing, and Monica Sawyer's Real Estate Investing for Women. And he's the host of a very popular real estate podcast titled The Smart Real Estate Coach, podcast. In just a moment, you're going to meet my guest and good friend, Chris Prefontaine, right after this. Well, hello, Chris, and welcome to the show. Hey, Jay. Great to see you as always. Glad to be back. It is, it is great to have you back, Chris. Every time we have you on the show, we get rave reviews. Everybody loves hearing your advice and wisdom. So what we're going to do here on the show, since this is raising private money, we're going to talk about private money first, your experience with that, Chris. And then we're going to move over to um, one of your top expertises, and that is buying and selling properties and controlling properties by using creative financing and uh, terms. So first, let's start out with private money. Just to make sure our listeners know what we're talking about. We're not talking about hard money. We're not talking about hard money lender brokers. When we say private money, we're talking about borrowing money, getting individuals just like us to fund our deals, invest in our deals, either by using their investment capital or and or their retirement funds. So Chris, uh, when and where and how did your private money journey and experience start? Man, in some shape, form or fashion, this would have been way pre-crash. So uh, late 90s, early 2000s um, by way of word of mouth. In other words, I remember like it was yesterday, my CPA, my attorney who sees all our deals saying, hey, I got this money sitting in IRA or 401k and I want to put it to work. I mean, that's how it started for me. I, I never, I was not, and still am not an expert like you, Jay, but that's how it started just by sort of chatting with people that I know. And of course, when someone does well with you and does well with anyone, they're going to, they're going to talk about it. So that, that was my short journey. And to this day, as you know, we're going to talk. Today. And we were having the conversation and they asked me, they said, well, Jay, how long has it been since you actively were, you know, teaching people about, you know, what private money is and how they can get high rates of return safely and security? I said, you know, it's probably been about 10 years since I actively was looking to uh, raise more private money because first of all, once we get private money, then they don't want it back. When we cash them out, they want us to put it back to work. Right. And so I've just been using the same millions of dollars over and over and over again. And of course, and I'm sure the same thing is for you, Chris, people get referred to us all the time from existing, you know, our private lenders that want to do business with us. Right. 
Yeah, that's what I meant. I mean, it just when I started with a circle of two or three people, and now I literally, if I had to, could pick up the phone and go, hey, I got this new deal. And so, yeah, it usually you treat people the right way. You do what you're supposed to do. You do what you say you're going to do, and then the money finds you. Yeah. You know, one misconception that new real estate investors have <laughs> is, first of all, who would loan me private money? And, you know, I've never done a deal or who's going to loan me private money. Um, well, the answer to the question is if, if you as the borrower don't pay the private lender, the property does. And what that means is we're not borrowing unsecured money. Uh, we're backing all the notes that we do by the real estate, uh, you know, that's being purchased. And, um, and I tell you, Chris, I, I know you've heard me say before, I got into this world of private money because I had a need. I mean, the first six years I was in the business, I thought you had, I didn't know anything about creative financing. I didn't know anything about terms. I'd never heard of it. Um, I thought you just had to uh, get your deals funded from the bank down the street. For that's what I did for the first six years from 2003 to 2009. And then in January, 2009, I got cut off from the banks like the rest of the world yeah. with no notice. And so I had to learn a different, you know, a different way. And you know what? It was the biggest blessing in disguise in my business because in this world of private money, we make the rules. Like we set the interest rate, we set the frequency of payments and we structure the whole deals. You know, the, the old uh, traditional way of borrowing money is you go to the bank, you get on your hands and knees and you put your hands underneath your chin and you say, please fund my deal, please fund my deal. But of course, in this world, it's not that. You're already approved. There is no application. There is no credit score that plays into this. There's no verification of income. What do we do? We put on our teacher hat, our private money teacher hat, and we teach people that we've got some kind of association with um, what private money is, what self-directed IRAs are. And so then they're chasing us and we're not chasing them. So, um, so in, in your world, Chris, have you raised private money for uh, commercial deals or single family houses only, or all the, all the above? All the above when I was doing it actively, uh, I remember doing those specifically for uh, condominium conversion projects where we bought like a six, not, not huge, like six, eight, nothing more than 10 units. And then turned those into condominiums from an engineering, legal and construction standpoint and borrowed the, the extra funds to do that. Uh, did a lot of that prior to the uh, 08 debacle. Um, and you said blessing in disguise. And I wrote it down, Jay, when you said it. Because you couldn't have convinced me during that 08 time frame, and you said 09. So right in that window, for me, it went to 12, I think. But you couldn't have convinced me that it was a good thing, but it was a great thing. Because as you alluded to, it's why, it's why we're doing what we're doing now. It's why you're doing what we are doing, right? So the, everything for a reason, I always say. Absolutely. <clears throat> so, Chris, um, let's move to your uh, one of your expertises, and that is doing terms, doing creative financing. So for the person that's never heard about terms, that's never heard about creative financing, what does that mean at its most basic level? Basic level would be because of what I went through in 08, uh, not utilizing banks because my credit was in the toilet and I had no cash, so they weren't financing me. And it means not putting up gobs of money. Maybe, maybe with some exceptions, we'll talk about ladies, small amounts of money, but no money of your own, no credit, and uh, no banks. That's what it means in a sense, uh, in essence. So, in the world of terms and creative financing, well, let me back up. In the world of private money, the private lender is doing the funding. Traditional borrowing, the bank is doing the funding. Um, you know, if someone's borrowing money from a hard money lender, the hard money broker is doing the funding. In the world of creative financing and terms, who is the bank? Uh, to, I'll give you two answers because obviously there's advanced stuff, but two answers. One is we love, love owner financing when, so the seller is going to be the bank, when the property is free and clear in particular. The building I'm standing in today was bought with free and clear seller, no mortgage, and they became the bank. So that's one. Two is, the reason I said two answers, when we buy a property subject to the seller's mortgage staying in place, the financing stays in place with the mortgage, with the uh, company that originally provided that seller with the mortgage, and they stay as the guarantor. We just buy the property. 
So those are my two favorites. Uh, and so there's no outside financing involved, especially not that you're going to ever sign on a pledge your, pledge your credit or assets for. Yeah. Well, I can tell you why I love subject to deals right now. Yeah. Because I saw a statistic by Jason Hartman. Uh, he uh, was our keynote speaker at my mastermind group meeting last week. And um, he's just a brilliant, smart real estate investor and, and economist. And uh, he had the stats to show us. It's like right at 90% of all the mortgages right now in the United States have, and he had it broken down by category, have got less than a 4% interest rate because everybody refied, you know, some of them are, you know, less than 3%. But 90% of them, less than 4%. And I'm going, man, you buy a subject to today and yeah. you inherit you inherit an interest rate less than 4%. I tell you what, you buy a house subject to the existing note at less than 4%. I don't ever want to get rid of that house. Right. Right. No, <laughs> spot on. I Just this morning, Jay, that's why I'm shaking my head. We had a student submit a deal. I said, well, send me the mortgage statement. 3.8. So I don't know about you, but I don't think we're going to see those rates. I, maybe not in my in my tenure here. I don't know, but I don't think real quickly. And so how cool would it be to learn how to do that? Like you and I just talked about, even if you, the listener says, well, maybe I'll just learn it to buy my own house. That's a big win. That's a skill set you'll never lose. So once you learn how to do that, you can go grab those 90% of those houses that have those awesome, awesome loans on them. Absolutely. And you know, there's a lot of truth when someone says, well, all those people, the, the, the reason, you know, people, the reason people aren't buying houses, well, number one, there's still a shortage of inventory, but number two, you hear it said, well, everybody that's got those mortgages at two point something and three point something percent, they're not going to get rid of those houses. They're going to hang on to them. That's true, except for one thing. There always has been, and there always will be motivated sellers of properties because, you know, distress comes along for all kinds of reasons. You know, uh, ever since Adam and Eve, people have been dying and there are inherited properties yep. and those inherited properties. Yes. A lot of them are free and clear. Well, as you just said, you can use your seller financing strategy on that, but all those inherited properties that come with a mortgage, there's a 90% chance it's got less than a 4%. So even though you hear in the news, people aren't selling houses, well, they're not selling houses unless they have distress. Um, what would your comment be about that, Chris? Well, I, get, I just thought of another one while you were talking. Um, this is big now. When COVID pushed all these values up, right? I'm building a house in another state right now, and this is rampant. And that is the tax assessment has been put sky high. People are annoyed. People are up in arms. But guess what? They got to sell. A lot of them have to sell. Like I'm hearing it time after time from my subcontractors and other people. And they had rates that were just tremendously low. That's one issue right there. Uh, second homes. Forget. So death, 100%. Second homes after COVID, people say, ah, you know, the media screaming negative. I don't agree with them, but they are. And they're scaring sellers. The sellers are dumping second homes and all kinds of crazy stuff. And the buyer pool has because of interest rates is a little bit more, uh, it's smaller, it's shrinking. Well, unbeknownst to them, there's people like you and I that'll gobble those up in a heartbeat. And so there's a lot of properties out there. We could, I could list, we could keep going. Dozen reasons why people will sell those properties. Exactly. What's your preferred exit strategies uh, or strategy when you buy a house on terms with creative financing, either the seller finances it if it's free and clear. Um, or you buy it subject to the existing note. What's your preferred exit strategy? I like still to this day, Jay, and we've refined it so, so much with my son handling the buyer side. And that is the rent to own program when done properly. Let me qualify that. I hear, and I'm sure you do podcast after podcast where people perhaps even teaching this, but, but guests on, on shows saying, yeah, you know, we exit rent to own and we don't really care if the buyers qualify because we just put another buyer in there and collect another check. That may be fine legally, but morally and ethically, it's not, in my opinion. So we deal with who? We deal with buyers, and this has been a major, major increase since COVID, who either one of two things. One, 
They started their own business. They left the corporate world because of COVID. They've got, they had great paying five, six, maybe close to seven figure incomes. So they have income. They had, they have 401k, they have nest egg. They go to buy a house. They can't get them alone for the most part of the very conventional aggressive rate because they need seasoning two years. Those are great buyers for our rent home program because they are going to cash it out. And the other buyers would be the people that sadly went through whatever hiccup personally that need credit uh, enhancement. So we still have a very, very low default rate, even coming through COVID. We default like somewhere between two and five. I'll be conservative and saying two and 10% default. The rest cash out. So we do set up a, a big win-win on those. Now, the properties that we own sub two to our earlier conversation, we want to own those forever. So we'll let the tenant buyer who comes in on the rent own program know that if they don't default the payment and they get their down payment up to 20%, then we'll own or finance them. They'll never have to see a bank. And that's pretty cool because we can be super competitive when we're buying houses in the two, three, four percent range. We can still be competitive and profitable on the owner financing and do the buyers a big favor. So that's our favorite uh, exit. And then kind of tier two is owner finance them if we're into that property for a long term. Yeah. I love your, um, your outlook. Uh, I've got the same philosophy. Uh, my wife, Carol Joy and I, we decided years ago uh, when we started our rent to own program selling it, we said, look, we're going to do everything that we can to help these people own a house. Yeah. Um, and I, I mean, as you say, I mean, it's true. If you don't help them, if you don't hold their hand, if you don't give them a plan, the likelihood of them ever, you know, getting ready for a mortgage is, you know, slim to none and slim just got up and left. Um, and, you know, a real estate entrepreneur or a real estate investor, when you know that that's going to be the case, you're really setting up your buyer for failure. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I want to feel good about my business and, and, you know, what I'm doing to lead with a servant's heart, everything we do and everything you do, Chris, uh, we're leading with a servant's heart. How do we do that? Well, in the world of private money, I'm not asking, begging or chasing. I'm actually teaching and serving these people. And up to, we have just received countless thank you notes and thank you, um, you know, conversations from our private lenders about changing their retirement years. And the same thing applies on when, you know, when you're working with sellers. I mean, when a seller responds to our marketing and they're in foreclosure, one of the first things we do is ask them, do you want to keep your property? And if they say yes, and we're able to give them an idea such about a loan modification or whatever, and they're able to keep their strictly, but you know, I believe in the law of reciprocity and what goes around comes around. Like Zig Ziglar says, if we help enough other people, you know, get what they need and want, we don't have to worry about ourselves. And then again, the same thing applies to the terms. Um, Chris, I got a question for you. My general rule of thumb, and there's always exceptions, there's always exceptions, but my general rule of thumb is if I pay all cash for a property with private money, and you know, some people won't sell on terms. I'm thinking about 411 Chatham Street right now, uh, free and clear house, negotiated to buy it with seller financing after repaired value, $240,000, only needed like $30,000 in rehab. He said, I want all cash, $90,000. And it, you know, didn't have any floor covering it. It didn't need some rehab. Well, I gave him a multiple offer. I said, I'll pay you all cash, 90,000. Or if you want, I'll pay you $120,000 and, you know, pay him $30,000 more with giving him monthly payments. Well, yeah. private money to fund the deal. If I'm paying all cash, I'm typically going to want to cash out. But if I'm buying on terms with creative financing, I'm typically going to want to sell on terms, rent to own, et cetera. Uh, do you agree with that philosophy? Oh yeah. hundred uh, percent. Give me an example. When we buy on a financing, remember I said earlier that I prefer free and clear. Well, 99%, almost all of those deals we do with very few exceptions, and we can talk about them if we have time, are done principal only payments. So like we bought it, this isn't just for low end homes. We bought a house in the water, Cape Cod, it's a resort area, not too far from here. 945,000, just under a million on the water. Kicker, 
seller was a realtor who couldn't sell it. She's a Boston realtor. We structured on that deal, 945,000 purchase. We structured $2,500 monthly principal only payments. Why would I ever want to cash out of that deal when I have 30,000 a year coming straight off a of principal, regardless of what I do with the house? And, and punchline, the, the buyer in that house waiting to get qualified is paying it every month, paying us with a, with a spread on top of it. So yes, the short answer is, of course, I want to stay in the deals. And then the sub two deals where there is no time ticker, you know, there's no term, there's no balloon. Um, I want to stay in those forever. I hope, I hope my grandkids have those houses because that's a, it's just a piggy bank. We, we trademarked what we call the three payday system. I feel like when we stay in the deal, and we own a finance. It's like creating a fourth payday that goes on for life, potentially, if you want it that long. I love it. Just in case um, any of our listeners need to hop off early before we finish, I know you've got a free gift for uh, all of our listeners. You want to go ahead and share that gift with them, uh, Chris? Yeah, they're going to get, and, and I want to I want to just disclose you here, this is not one of those free gifts that you got to get through the, the funnel and then you got to pay for shipping. All right, We give you the books for free. We're going to send you a couple. Uh, we have uh, four now. We're going to send you two of our best-selling books, Real Estate on Your Terms and Deal Structure Overtime. Uh, we might throw in some other goodies in there for you. Uh, just go to wickedsmartbooks.com forward slash J1. J, the numeric number one. <clears throat> Is that the initial J or J-A-Y? J-A-Y. Good clarification. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So again, uh, nice and slow. Uh, let everybody know what that URL website is. Yeah. Wicked Smart Books with an S. Wicked smart books with an s.com forward slash j a y numeric number one awesome now terms can you only um can you only buy properties or only single family houses on terms or what kind of asset classes can you structure with uh terms yeah i love this jay because since literally 1600s this has been done you can buy any asset class. And as you know, people buy boats and cars and all kinds of things on terms. Um, this office building I'm standing in was bought on terms. We've done multis on terms. Um, I love um, being out there doing all kinds of asset classes. However, the reason people say, well, why do you teach primarily single family? Then? Because if I ever got into a room and started teaching, you can do all this stuff. The shiny object syndrome kicks in, right? Oh, I want to get one of those buildings. Oh, I want to get, no, you, then you'll never have a business. So we start with singles, and when you know the skill set, no one can take it from you. You can buy anything you want. You can go target things you want. We literally target if we want an office building. Uh, I sold this one. I sold this one last month. So I'm literally targeting zip codes to buy another one free and clear and do the same thing again. It's that simple. So any asset class really can be negotiated on terms. Yeah. So um, I know we've only got about seven and a half minutes left. So I'm going to ask you to answer a um, three-day seminar in seven minutes or less. <laughs> okay. <laughs> a I three can do day that. seminar. I'm from England, Jay. I can do it quick. <laughs> a three-day seminar question. So what are some of the most valuable um, tips and strategies and advice you can give on how to negotiate with a seller? So this is going to be a wide-open question. So you, you go with it the way you want to. Sure. What are some tips and strategies from your years of experience that um, that would be helpful when uh, we are negotiating with a seller of a property? And what is it about your offer and your talk off and your conversation that would convince them to take your seller financed offer yep. over and beyond cash? Yeah, this is key. When I just got from mastermind saying this to, to one of my higher level groups, when you approach a seller conversation with one thing, maybe two things in mind, you will always come out of that feeling good in either a deal or not, but it's okay. And here's why I say that. When you approach the conversation, how can I help this seller? What is their, one of two things, what is their problem they're trying to solve that the market's not solving or what goal are they trying to accomplish that their market's not providing? So two quick examples. One, Divorced couple, uh, not too far from here. Uh, one's on the mortgage, one's on the deed. Their problem they were trying to solve is they ran out of rehab money, financed it on credit cards, and were in arrears two months. Problem they need to solve? They need arrears caught up or they're going into foreclosure. And because they're divorced, they don't want to live there anymore. They want closure in the house, period. So we bought that sub too. So we solved a problem. On the other side of the coin, if someone's free and clear like this building, are we trying to solve a problem? 
Usually not. Usually it's the trying to accomplish a goal the market's not providing, and that is full price, even a premium price. We paid a slight premium in this one. And what were they trying to do on top of that? Tax planning and estate planning. Sadly, I think he knew this gentleman passed away after a few years being a seller of financing, but he provided his wife and his son a cash flow stream, not a building, right? So we provided him a solution to his goal the market was not giving him on our financing. And um, on the couple side, we fixed a major headache. So if you can do one of those two things, now if you can't, it's okay. No, Chris, I need the cash tomorrow to go buy my family a house in this particular area. And there's nothing you can say about that's going to change my mind. And it doesn't matter if I take less. Okay, I'm not your buyer. If something changes, I'm your plan B. That's it. And don't be attached to it. Look for people that you can help. I love it. There's the philosophy again, leading with a servant's heart, looking to help, looking to solve their problem, which is their pain, helping them get out of pain, whether that's financial pain or emotional pain. So when you are negotiating with a seller and they have a mortgage, obviously the first thing we think about is subject to buying it subject to, well, you know what the monthly payment's going to be because that's already established by the current mortgage that's in place. So we know what the underlying debt is. We know what the monthly payment is. However, on the other, <clears throat> on the, in the other case for seller financing, it's free and clear. There is no mortgage. So you're going to be creating a new mortgage. What advice would you give on how do you go about establishing and offering a monthly payment? Or you might start out by asking, getting a number out of them. What's the least they could take per month? So how, how does the conversation go yeah. on negotiating monthly payment, no down payment or a down payment? I'm usually going to start with, uh, I tell them either three variables and I tell them the picture of Seesaw or if they're bringing up other variables like interest rate, down, turn, you know, if they bring up a lot, I'll use a quadrant. But either way, the conversation goes like this. Uh, if they say, well, I, I need a down payment or I need this price. I say, all right, listen, Jay. I have a few variables that you and I have to work on. And I obviously can't give you all of them. That wouldn't be fair. So we've got price, we've got term, the length, and we've got monthly. Now, if they bring up something else like interest rate or, or whatever, I'll add it. I'll add the four. But I'll say which one, number one in that list of three or four is most important to you. And then what's second most important. And then I'll go back and work on that. And I'll make sure because sometimes we, we jump the gun and and get nervous about no down or get nervous about price when they didn't need that or want that. So just find out what variable out of those three or four is most important to them and then solve for that. Now, in the meantime, what do I want to make sure I do? If they're free and clear, I know in my head, I'm going out to the rent to own market. If I'm going out to the rent to own market, I have to be cognizant of what the rates are today that my buyer is going to be looking at this house and saying, well, I'm going to be at this amount eventually. I have to be below that to make any spread every month, which is what we call our payday too. So I'm going to be cognizant of that as I'm talking to them, but I'm going to first find out what's most important on their list of, uh, on the pecking order. So again, repeat those initial three variables again, initial if, you three them, if you get them to prioritize. Yeah. If they don't bring up anything else, I want to focus them on price, length of term and monthly payment, these free and clear people. If they don't bring up anything else, those are the three I want them to prioritize for me. Awesome. Um, and down payment was not in there, right? Correct. Cause they didn't bring it up yet. <laughs> if they bring it up, I'll, here's the script. I'll give you a script. If All they right. bring it up, I say, Jay, um, the sellers I buy from typically, cause this, this, this works on their ego, the script. It's, it's just brilliant. Uh, most of the sellers I buy from prefer top dollar versus a small down payment. They usually don't need the money in the, the, the response I'll get from a seller is, well, I don't need the money. Okay. <laughs> so we take that off the table. We should work on these other three variables. It's magical when you use that script. I love it. I love it. Most of the buyers I buy from today are more interested in uh, the top dollar price versus the down payment because they don't need the money. Well, and I, I use the word small versus a small down payment. Like you're belittling them. You, you don't need that small amount of money. You want the price. <laughs> I love it. That is a brilliant script. One more time, Chris, uh, give out the URL for the, um, for the free gifts that you and your team are going to ship out. Sure. Wicked smart books.com forward slash J A Y and numeric number one. That is awesome. Chris, it is always a blast to have you come here on raising private money. And um, 
final parting words and advice as we close out? Yeah, because you and I love teaching, I, and I'm not so naive to think that uh, either one of us have the, the best niche, right? They're all awesome niches. So here's three quick tips. Find a niche that you can get behind that you love. Find someone in that niche like Jay or myself that have been through a bunch of cycles and then put the blinders on for three to seven years and you'll have a great experience. Don't get caught up in the shiny object syndrome. Awesome advice, Chris. Thank you so much for joining us here on Raising Private Money. Thank you, buddy. You got it. And there you have it. Another amazing episode of Raising Private Money. I'm Jay Connor, the Private Money Authority, wishing you all the best. And we really appreciate the subscribes. Ring that bell if you're watching on YouTube so you don't miss out on future episodes. And if you happen to be listening on uh, iTunes or on Spotify, be sure and follow me. We look forward to seeing you right here on the next episode of Raising Private Money. Are you feeling inspired by the knowledge you gained in this episode? Then head over to jconner.com slash money guide. That's jconner.com slash money guide and download your free guide that shares seven reasons why private money will skyrocket your real estate investing business right now. Again, that's jconner.com slash money guide to get your free guide. We'll see you next time on Raising Private Money with Jay Connor.